Good morning. Uh, welcome. I hope you can hear me. Um, welcome, everybody, to this uh, first um, lecture on this 2020-2021 Food Control Series on behalf of the Department of Interpreting and Translation of the University of Bologna and with the endorsement of the International Network Track. Um, my name is uh, Nicoleta Spinolo. I'm a member of the MCT lab and of the Department of Interpreting and Translation, which are hosting the lectures this academic year. Uh, so before we start, we're going to start right away, but I'd like to mention a few news. Uh, so remember that all of our, our lectures will be split into two parts. They will be more or less 20 minutes each, uh, with five minutes of break in the queue. Will refresh a little bit. Um, I would ask you to please turn off your microphones and webcams and may ask questions uh, through the chat of the event at any time, uh, but I will only forward them to the presenter at the end of the second part of the presentation. Uh, please start uh, your question by stating the way you would like to be addressed in your creation. Uh, also, uh, please uh, bear in mind that uh, actually is being recorded. They're telling me that they can't hear me very well. It's because we have two microphones here. Uh, I still hope that you should be um, able to listen uh, with good quality to the speaker. I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Um, so our topic today is bibliometrics, which is broadly defined as the statistical study of the flux of scientific information. And one of its applications is that of describing the and the sociology of science or of specific disciplines. Uh, in this talk specifically, we will learn how bibliometric methods can contribute to picture the evolution of translation and interpreting studies in general and of cognitive translation and interpreting studies in particular. Here is Dr. Christian Olaya Soler. Uh, Dr. Olaya is a member of the Institute and is working as a postdoc here. He will be presenting part of his current work that has already been in a prominent scholar in the bibliometric English and interpreting studies. So, uh, Dr. Olaya, Christian, thank you for being here today on the Zoom. Thank you very much. I hope you can see me and Hear me well. Uh, I just need to uh, set up my presentation. We're ready to go. So thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, thank you uh, for being here today. I hope that you find this presentation interesting. Uh, I'm going to talk about bibliometrics today. Uh, as uh, Nicoletta, my colleague, said, um, this lecture will be split into two parts. Uh, during the first part, I'm going to present uh, what is bibliometrics uh, and what we do in, in bibliometric research. And then I will move on and I will speak about uh, the history or bibliometric aspects of uh, translation, interpreting. Um, so, uh, I will just start by introducing the concept of bibliometrics, this term. Uh, infometrics is the, uh, let's say, the, the, the umbrella term. It's a term that is uh, somehow on the top of many other terms that describe how information, how the flux of information is, um, is distributed uh, in, in, in society, in academic networks, and so on. So uh, we have bibliometrics and we have scientometrics, and these two terms, in fact, are synonyms. We can use them um, interchangeably. Webometrics, netometrics, and cybermetrics are terms that describe how information is distributed using the web, uh, web services. And then we also have altmetrics, which is a term that I'm going to, to explain in a bit of a bit more in a couple of slides, and um, this term just focuses on how information uh, is distributed using uh, social media, and specifically academic social media. 
So uh, bibliometrics is the oldest term, and it's the one that I personally use to uh, frame my research. Although, as I said, bibliometrics and centrometrics are used um, interchangeably. I will now uh, speak about, very briefly, uh, about the history of bibliometrics, just a couple of facts so that we uh, know where do we come from. So in 1926, uh, Lotka is one of, he's one of the first scholars uh, to propose a bibliometric law. And uh, in a seminal paper, he describes uh, how scientific productivity is distributed uh, according to uh, the number of authors in publications. So uh, one year after that, uh, a couple of uh, scholars uh, carried out a very small um, study where they described uh, chemical education from a bibliometric point of view. So they tried to describe how how scientific information on chemical education was distributed um, in publications, uh, journals, uh, books, and so on and so forth. Uh, many years later, uh, Sheeran and Garfield, the, these two scholars, maybe you're familiar with them because uh, we all know the, the impact, the journal impact factor and the, and the science citation index. These two scholars propose one of the most um, used and well-known metrics in, in library metrics. And this matrix is used to uh, measure uh, impact, uh, scholarly impact in terms of citations. And this index is used for journals, not for um, measuring, for example, authors' impact, uh, for example. Some years later, in 78, uh, the first uh, international scholar journal on uh, Bibliometrics is founded, which is Science Metrics. And a couple of years later, uh, we had the first uh, conference, international conference on bibliometrics. In 2005, uh, you know, the, the, the journal impact factor and citation index uh, were highly criticized. And uh, there was a scholar called Kirk who uh, developed another uh, metric, which is the age index. I'm not going to explain exactly what it is, but anyway, uh, it's another important moment in the development of bibliometrics. Uh, from 2010 onwards, we start speaking about Scientometrics uh, 2.0. Scientometrics 2.0 is uh, the term that we use to describe the impact that web, uh, that uh, social media, that uh, online publishing has had in the way we communicate in scholarly groups and scholarly um, uh, communities. And then in 2015, 2016, we start uh, speaking about all metrics. All metrics are different metrics that try to understand or try to capture impact in a different way. We Here we try to uh, understand how uh, the dissemination of information through social media helps us to get impact in our research. For, so for example, uh, in all metrics, we analyze the impact of sharing our research through Twitter, through ResearchGate, through uh, online repositories, and so on and so forth. So um, this is as I said, a very brief uh, history of bibliometrics. And now I would like to focus on, uh, sorry about this, uh, here. Uh, so you can see that. Now, the applications of uh, bibliometrics. So um, first of all, uh, bibliometrics is useful to describe the history of science. This is in fact, uh, a part of the research that I'm uh, carrying out uh, right now using bibliometrics applied to uh, cognitive translation integrity research. Uh, it's also very useful to uh, understand the sociology of science, how, for example, scholars communicate among themselves, how information is distributed among scholars. 
It's also useful to uh, develop uh, scientific policies uh, and, and specifically um, assessment policies for scholars, for researchers. Uh, just to give an example, and I think that it's very uh, important for all of us, is that uh, in, a, in a study that I conducted together with my colleagues, Javier Francoshina and Sergio Villastela, we uh, saw, we, we, we identified that um, the citation windows that are applied in the most important um, places, such as Journal Impact Factor or Scopus Science Score, are not applicable to translation interpreting studies. We would need at least a six or seven year um, citation window in order to understand or to have a broad image of the impact of our research. Uh, library policies are also important in bibliometric uh, research. We can help libraries to decide what journals should they subscribe to, how should they, uh, for example, fund new uh, journals, and uh, last but not least, uh, bibliometrics also plays a role in uh, organizing information in a way that is useful, useful for, for all of us and also to, to manage this information. Uh, let me now focus on the strengths of bibliometric research. First of all, uh, bibliometrics, uh, it's generally very objective. Why? Because uh, we tend to uh, gather data from databases that are curated um, by, by many people normally. Uh, for example, Web of Science, Scopus, uh, are generally very good uh, databases, although they have some biases that I will uh, talk about later. So if the database is correct, if the database has a good coverage, then uh, the data gathered is objective and the, the analysis that can be conducted are generally very objective. Uh, research uh, using bibliometric approaches is also very replicable. If I download a copy of a database and another scholar downloads another copy of the same database with the same criteria, we will probably get to the same results. So we will always have this ability to replicate our results and also extend them. The practicality of uh, bibliometric research is also very high. I just talked about the applications of uh, bibliometric research. So, uh, as I said, there are many ways of applying what we see in, in, in bibliometric research to uh, our way of doing science. Uh, there is no human interaction here, so uh, we are getting rid of subjectivity when trying to gather data from, from participants. There's always some kind of subjectivity there. Uh, of course, there's subjectivity in the way that the databases are created and, and curated and, and fed. But um, this, this subjective inter-participant subjectivity uh, is not uh, there. Also, if you don't like uh, communicating with people, bibliometric research is very good for you. So you don't have to face uh, or people or gather participants to do your research. And last but least, um, that are generally accessible. Uh, the two main databases in, in bibliometric research are Scopus and Web of Science. If your institution uh, has a subscription to those databases, it's very easy, easy to, to download data from, from there. Uh, Google Scholar is not so easy because you need to use software to download information from there. But anyway, uh, that, uh, as I said, is generally accessible. Regarding the drawbacks, well, uh, I just mentioned that before. Uh, we may have issues in, uh, in data quality. If the database is not uh, adequately uh, curated and fed. Uh, for example, in Web of Science, we see, and in Scopus too, we see that they tend to concentrate on journal articles. So books are not indexed there, or many of the books that are published are not, in, are not indexed there. And of course, there are sciences where books or book chapters are very important. And humanities, generally, 
tend to publish in books and papers. So if those databases do not include information, bibliometric and bibliographic information on those publication formats or also on those languages um, that are not, uh, let's say, the main languages used to, to produce science, uh, then we, our results will have, um, uh, the quality of our results will be not optimal. So, as I said, data quality and bibliographic coverage are the main drawbacks here. So, uh, I will now focus on what we investigate. Uh, first of all, we can investigate the authors who has published research in a discipline. For example, the number of authors. I just mentioned humanities, where we tend to publish uh, books and, and articles and book chapters uh, as single authors, but in sciences like uh, natural sciences, um, medicine, and so on and so forth, uh, co-authorship is much uh, frequent than in humanities. We can also see what tendencies there are in the way that we publish. For example, if authorship grows with time, um, we also uh, can investigate productivity. How many documents does a author publish in his or her career? And how do we collaborate? Uh, Co-authorship networks are very interesting to, to observe. I will present some um, co-authorship networks in, in a couple of slides, and you will see that we can discover many interesting things there. Uh, now we will move on to the origins of research. First, we can check what countries are the ones that publish the most in a specific uh, discipline, or what institutions, or in what languages, and on what topics. Uh, for example, uh, we, can, we can see uh, from a uh, diachronic perspective how the topics investigated in, a, in a, the field or in a discipline change over time. Uh, what was very uh, interesting in the 70s, maybe it's not in the 80s, and uh, there has been a change in the way we uh, investigate also this, this topic. We can also investigate the sources. Uh, for example, we can see if there's a concentration of publications in specific sources. For example, uh, what journals in translation and deputing studies tend to publish uh, research on audiovisual translation, or uh, what specific journals or, or, or sources tend to publicate uh, research on bibliometrics in translation and deputing research. So there we can find specific points of concentration uh, of publications um, regarding uh, topics, for example, or of languages and so on. We can also investigate how publications are distributed, for example, what uh, institutions uh, uh, use or subscribe to what um, journals or, or databases. We can also investigate how the number of sources have grown, for example, open access in translation interpreting uh, studies was um, a very important moment in, in the creation and the foundation of new journals. And also we can investigate the source types. For example, if books, chap books and, and book chapters are very important in uh, translation interpreting studies as they are, for example, in linguistics, or if we tend to publish more journal articles than book chapters or, or books, and we then uh, go closer, move closer to, to natural sciences like psychology, uh, or sciences like psychology. So. Uh, we can also investigate the contents. We can investigate, of course, what is being researched at a specific time or diachronically. We can also investigate what keywords um, uh, scholars using to describe uh, their research. We can also investigate uh, how information is being distributed through code citation analysis, for example. And we can also investigate how long the publications are, for example, or the reference lists. And finally, uh, we also can uh, research impact. And this is one of the main applications or, or the main focus 
uh, focuses in, in, in bibliometric research. We can investigate citation and co-citation patterns. So how people are uh, citing each other, what kind of relationships are being established between scholars uh, from their citations. We can also investigate citation classics. For example, we have all uh, cited in our publications specific uh, books, for example, that are very famous and that we maybe don't know exactly why are we uh, citing them, but we do that because it's like a tendency. It's like to cite them because they are part of the main uh, or the seminal works in, in translation in Tibetan studies. And of course, we can study centrality, what authors are the most prominent ones, which are the most cited ones, and why. How do we do that? Well, we need data, and we gather this data from databases, and, and, and we use data management tools to uh, manage this data, to clean it up, to prepare it for analysis. And uh, we use statistical analysis. Bibliometrics is based on statistics. We mainly carry out quantitative statistical analysis. So we use or we develop metrics like journal impact factor, that is a metric, and we use statistical tools and specific bibliometric tools, uh, for example, to visualize um, citation networks, to authorship networks, as I will present uh, later on. So I will now move to bibliometrics in translation interpreting studies. Uh, look, here, uh, I suppose you can't see that from, from your computers, and it's okay, this is not the, the aim of this presentation. Uh, sorry, from, uh, this is not the aim of this slide. Um, here you can see a list of publications devoted to bibliometrics in translation interpreting studies. And, uh, until uh, the year 2014, we have uh, 15 documents. Uh, so this is 20, a 22 years plan. And from 2015 to 2019, uh, we have 15 documents. So in, in only four years, we have published as much as in the previous 22 years. And uh, a very special moment for bibliometric research in diabetic studies was the publication of a special issue in Perspectives, co-edited by Javier Franco Chilas, Adovira Esteban, and Pilar Oreiro. So, uh, bibliometric analysis in transition interpreting research is gaining momentum. It's being very, um, uh, it's used a lot in, in China, for example, right now. And uh, we have specific databases for translation interpreting studies. For example, we have Sirin, uh, which is edited by Jill, Daniel Jill, and we have Reti, which is edited by the Humanities Library at UAB in Spain. Uh, these are not specific uh, databases with bibliometric and bibliographic data, uh, but we have translation studies bibliography and Vitra. Uh, translation studies bibliography is edited by Yves Gambier and Luc Pandosla. And Vitra is edited by Fadil Franco uh, We, uh, we, uh, my colleagues use Vitra for research, and I will now explain why we use this tool. We love Vitra because it's open access. This is the first uh, important information that I would give uh, on Vitra. It's open access. You can access it freely from everywhere in the world. Um, it's the biggest specific database for translation interpreting studies with more than 80,000 uh, registries. And it uh, includes information on many, many, many journals, which are in fact not indexed. You will, you will find this, these journals devoted to translation interpreting research in journal citation reports or in Scopus or in TSB. So, uh, BITRA is a very good uh, source to conduct um, bibliometric research, which we do recommend, and it's the one that we use. Um, so, now uh, I will stop here for five minutes, so you can have a little break to process all this information, and uh, we will come back in five minutes, and I will delve on uh, those bibliometric aspects 
that we have discovered in research carried out uh, in translation, interpreting, and cognition. So thank you so much, and see you in five minutes. Okay, let's now resume with the second part of the lecture. In the second part, uh, Dr. Olaya will focus more on cognitive translation and embedding studies, as he announced before the break. And this will also be a way of showing the potential applications of bibliometrics to other research fields. Uh, please bear in mind that you can uh, send questions at any time during the conference, and we will collect them and uh, act with the speaker at the end. The second part. So the floor is yours again. Thank you, uh, Nicoletta. So we'll now focus on uh, translation, interpreting, and cognition, and the research that has been carried out uh, here and its bibliometric analysis. So, as my colleague just said, um, I'm not going to present many results from, from a study that I conducted together with my colleagues, uh, Sara Rovira Esteban and Javier Franco Echera. And uh, maybe you will find that if you're not uh, focusing on this kind of research, maybe this data doesn't tell you much. But uh, what I would like to, to let you know that you discover is that bibliometric analysis can be applied to any subfields, subdiscipline within translation interpreting studies. So maybe this could give you ideas to conduct a bibliometric analysis in your specific fields, for example, history of uh, translation, uh, literary translation, or visual translation, interpreting, and so on and so forth. So uh, I just hope to give you some ideas for uh, future research using bibliometrics. So, uh, yes, so you can see that, yeah. So, uh, our aim was to um, identify characteristics that made cognitive translation and interpreting studies uh, different uh, from a bibliometric perspective from translation and interpreting studies. So to do that, uh, we gathered a corpus uh, from Vitra with more than 2,000 documents, registries of documents uh, related to, to cognitive research in translation interpreting, and more than 77,000 documents uh, devoted to the general uh, research in translation interpreting studies. We also analyzed more than 7,500 citations uh, accrued by publications uh, on cognitive research and more than uh, 1,000, uh, oh, sorry, 100,000 uh, citations to translation interpreting uh, studies documents. We used the period of analysis that ranged from 1976 uh, to 2015. Uh, we started in 1976 uh, because we think that uh, at this point of time, uh, cognitive translation interpreting studies start to develop um, in a very uh, fast pace. Uh, and we finished our uh, analysis in 2015 because uh, generally uh, databases that compile bibliographic data need about three to four years to um, complete or to uh, uh, fit everything that has been done in a single year. So uh, we conducted this study in 2019-2020, so we considered that 2015 was the right point to end. And also, as I said before, uh, we generally need six to seven years in order to perceive the impact of a publication within translation interpreting studies. So we left a bit of a margin there so that uh, publications could get some impact, uh, even those 
published in 2015. So uh, I will now present uh, some of the results. Uh, for example, bibliometric analysis can help us to identify, identify phases of development of a discipline or a subfield or a subdiscipline. These are the number of publications devoted to cognitive research uh, over time in 10 year periods. And uh, from these figures, uh, we observe that there is a seminal phase in which uh, publications tend to start to appear, but they are very seldom, that there are not many publications dealing with this topic. Then we have an initial phase where we start to see an increase in the number of publications in this subfield, and also many of the seminal works in cognitive translation and cognitive studies are written in this. Finally, we see or we uh, consider that from uh, 1996 onwards, we have a rooting phase, a phase where um, cognitive translation and cognitive studies uh, kick off and starts developing uh, in a many, in many, many, many topics. Uh, many scholars um, join uh, the, the, this subfield and uh, it starts to grow very, very rapidly. Uh, uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, the first publication devoted to uh, cognition, translation, and deputy uh, was published in 1910, and it uh, was devoted to uh, interpreting, uh, and it was uh, framed in psychology. Many psychologists were um, uh, in, impacted by, by how interpreters could uh, change from one language to another and to do this in a very uh, simultaneous way. So uh, in this table you can see the proportion of documents published in, in those phases, uh, in those periods of time. So you see that uh, translation interpreting studies um, is focusing a lot on cognitive translation interpreting studies. The number of publications in, in, in this subfield is growing a lot, uh, especially in the last period, we see a, a tremendous growth in the number of publications. So we're gaining momentum and we're getting a lot of attention in the general uh, field of translation interpreting studies. I will now move on to the most frequent keywords that are used in publications devoted to cognition, translation, and interpreting, uh, specifically uh, those keywords that we could identify in the titles of these publications. Uh, to do that, we extracted the titles of these uh, 2,000 uh, publications, and we analyzed them by identifying and labeling keywords, and we assigned them to different uh, categories. For example, uh, we analyzed those titles uh, from the point of view of the research topics that were being investigated, the conceptual frameworks used to, to explain uh, a study that was being conducted, the professional fields that were being explored, the languages used in the, in the, in the studies, the methods and the participants that were taking part uh, in, the, in the studies. Uh, I must say that uh, you cannot find all this information in a title. A title needs to be communicative, so you won't find, for example, titles that include information on the research topics, on the framework, on the professional fields investigated, the languages, the methods, and the participants. So right now I'm conducting this uh, sub-study again, but focusing or using the abstracts of these publications where much more information is given. Uh, here you will find, uh, as I said, information uh, extracted from the titles. And for example, you can see that regarding research topic, one of the most frequent ones is training. Um, this is because uh, cognitive transition interpreting studies tries to uh, investigate 
how professionals and how students translate and interpret, and what can we learn from that in order to improve uh, the way we train them. Creativity has also been uh, investigated a lot. Uh, translation competence too, specifically uh, from the 90s onwards, and the concept of strategy, which is also very um, uh, related to uh, technique, uh, has been also very um, common. Regarding conceptual frameworks, uh, we see that many of the um, investigations carried out here were framed in psycholinguistics, psychology, cognitive linguistics, neurolinguistics, relevance theory, cognitive transatology. And I would like to um, focus on two aspects here. First of all, um, linguistics tends to be a very uh, common framework for um, investigations on cognitive aspects in translation targeting. So psycholinguistics, cognitive linguistics, neurolinguistics, and cognitive transatology is uh, one, two, three, four, five, the sixth most frequent use conceptual framework. And this is important because uh, the concept of um, cognitive transatology was only introduced in 2010. So in only five years, it's already the sixth um, framework uh, that is used the most. Regarding professional fields, uh, we see that simultaneous interpreting has been researched a lot, specifically or, or in, in the, in, during the first phases of development of, the, of uh, cognitive translation interpreting studies, audiovisual translation too, uh, and post editing too, and audiovisual translation and post editing have gained momentum in the last two decades. Regarding languages, English, Chinese, Spanish, and French are the most uh, used ones in order to conduct uh, empirical research. And regarding methods, we tend to use eye tracking, which is uh, quite novel in our subdiscipline. Think a lot techniques, which started in the 90s uh, approximately, 80s, 90s. Keylogging, which started in the, in the year 2000, and retrospection, which has been the for quite a long time. Again. Regarding participants, uh, we tend to compare professional translators and transition students. Uh, we also tend to use uh, professional interpreters as samples, but uh, it's very difficult also to find studies that include interpreting students to compare them to uh, professional interpreters. Uh, this may be because it's difficult to access such samples because normally they are very small and uh, interpreting students tend to, to concentrate in, in MA levels, so it's difficult to, to, to access them. Regarding publication languages, uh, here you will find a figure that compares uh, research and general research in the field of translation interpreting. And uh, there are two aspects that I would like to uh, remark here. First of all, English is used um, much more uh, than in, in, in cognitive translation and interpreting studies than in translation and interpreting studies. So we tend to use English much more as a lingua franca than in the general research into translation and interpreting. And the second thing that I would like to, to remark is that German was one of the main languages, uh, publication languages, specifically at the beginning of the discipline, in, those, in this initial phase, as we will see in, uh, in a couple of slides. Regarding publication formats, well, in, in terms of publishing articles, we see no difference between cognitive research and uh, general research into translation and interpreting. Uh, but there is a, a big difference uh, in the case of books. Books are uh, more frequent in general research into translation and interpreting than in cognitive translation and interpreting studies. But chapters are more frequent in CTIS. And this could mean we have an improvement Yet, but our hypothesis is that in cognitive translation interpreting studies, we tend to publish uh, co-edited volumes, where we publish uh, 
chapters from different authors. While in translation interpreting studies, it could be that uh, it's more frequent to publish single authored uh, volumes. Regarding authorship in cognitive translation interpreting studies, um, there are 2,128 documents written by a total of 1,477 different authors in cognitive translation interpreting studies. So uh, we represent only 4% of all authors in translation and interpreting research. This means that we are a very small community uh, but we have published quite a lot and hopefully with quite an impact in the general discipline. I will now move on to co-authorship networks. What we are going to see now are two networks of co-authorship. That means that authors have published together uh, a publication. And uh, here in this first uh, co-authorship network, um, what we see is like three circles. A general circle here, the one outside the center, uh, represents authors that have published at least four publications on cognitive translation interpreting studies, uh, but uh, they haven't done that in co-authorship. They have done that uh, in, uh, a single author. Here in the center, we see uh, circles that are a bit bigger and start to have different colors. Colors uh, represent clusters of scholars that tend to work together, that have at least four publications co-authored between them. So, for example, we have here outside uh, of the main circle uh, many authors already in, with, with, with different colors that mark those different clusters. And here in the middle, we have some big, big clusters of scholars that tend to work together. Uh, in the following uh, co-authorship network, we will focus on this inner circle, the circle here, and we will analyze this uh, a bit further. So this is the same uh, co-authorship network, but we have to uh, zoom in to this um, center of the circle. And I have added some boxes and some numbers to the, the different names of the authors that, that are here in the center. Uh, and why have I do that? Uh, well, I've done that because uh, what we see from these co-authorship networks is that we tend to collaborate, that we tend to publish um, documents with the people that work in the same country as we do. So co-authorship in cognitive translation interpreting studies tends to be at a country level, generally because we have research groups that are uh, situated in the same place, uh, or maybe because um, we have countries that with, with different universities that are carrying out research on cognitive aspects of translation interpreting, and they work together. For example, cluster number one would be uh, uh, composed by scholars in Switzerland, number two, uh, Sweden, number three, United States of America, number four, Finland, number five, Argentina, six, Austria, seven, Brazil, eight, Spain, nine, uh, Denmark, and ten, Germany. So, as I said, um, co-authorship tends to be at a uh, country level, but of course you can see that there are uh, some uh, links between um, scholars of different clusters. This is so because we also tend to uh, publish books, co-edited co -edited books, uh, with people from different universities. And these links between people from different clusters are represented by these publications of co-edited books. I will now move to impact uh, in terms of citations. I would like to stress that uh, me, uh, Sara Rovira and Javier Franco, we do not consider citations as quality. We just consider citations as impact. As you know, uh, citations can measure many things. 
you can cite someone because you agree with what they say, you can cite someone because you don't agree with what they say. There are many ways and many reasons to, to quote another. So we do not link citation to quality, but only to impact. Uh, having said that, uh, the figures you, you can see here, what they tell us is that uh, scholars in cognitive translation interpreting studies tend to receive more citations uh, than scholars in the global discipline in translation and interpreting studies. This may be uh, due to the fact that we are a, a very small community. As I said, we're 4% of all authors in translation and interpreting research. So it's very easy to know what is being done to be aware of uh, new publications, and it's then easier to uh, cite new publications and cite each other. Uh, here you can see two figures that present the likelihood of being cited as time advances. The figure on your left uh, presents the likelihood of being cited for the first time, that means receiving your first citation in a publication, and the one on the right presents the likelihood of being cited uh, as time advances repeatedly, uh, not, not focusing on the, on the first citation. And in the figure on the right, you can see that uh, both site TIS and translation interpreting studies uh, tend to behave in the same way. So it doesn't matter if you're working in CTIS or in translation interpreting studies, uh, the likelihood of being cited as time advances is more than the, more than the same. We do see a difference in the, in, the, in the figure on the left, where we see that uh, the likelihood of being cited for the first time in, in cognitive research is uh, faster uh, than in transition interpreting studies. So uh, you will have to wait less time in order to get your first citation if you publish an article devoted to cognitive aspects of transition interpreting. Uh, I'm finishing, just a couple of slides more. Uh, here you can see the most uh, cited authors in cognitive transition interpreting studies. Uh, in this uh, table, you will see on the left, uh, the figures for the whole period of analysis, that means from 76 to 2015. And on the right, we focused on citations received only from 2006 to 2015. And you will see that the names are in fact quite different. Uh, on the left, you can see many of the seminal works in cognitive translation interpreting studies. Many of the scholars that wrote those seminal works, for example, Wood with the relevance theory, Kussmaul, Krings, Hirgon and Condit, Jaskelein and Jakobsen, uh, Strieff, Löscher, and Kölner. Uh, if we focus on our last period of analysis, the most recent one for us, uh, you see that the, the names are in fact quite different. We start to see scholars that conduct uh, empirical research. On the left, uh, most of the scholars are devoted to translation theory, but on the left, on the right, we start to see, as I said, scholars that conduct these studies. Uh, we see, for example, Göpperich, uh, Angeloni, O'Brien, Aldous, Schrieff, Jakobsen, Traxe, Portalo, Munoz, and yes, yeah. uh, I'm going to conclude right now. Uh, what we saw with this study is that there are some specificities in cognitive transition interpreting studies that make uh, this subdiscipline a bit different from a bibliometric perspective uh, from translation interpreting studies. For example, we use English as a lingua franca much more frequently than, than translation interpreting studies. German was very prominent at the beginning of the, of the subdiscipline. Uh, book chapters uh, are more frequent in, in cognitive translation interpreting studies than in translation interpreting studies. The authorship tends to be at a uh, national uh, country level, and authorship, in fact, is uh, much more frequent than, um, than in translation interpreting studies. And um, it's easier or faster to get your first citation if you know, a publication if you uh, publish a document related to uh, cognitive transition interpreting studies. 
we have seen that there is a constant growth of cognitive transition deficit studies within transition deficit studies. So the discipline is growing, is gaining attention, is gaining momentum. And we also have identified those three phases, I mean, a seminal, an initial, and a rooting phase, which is the one that we can see that we are right now. Uh, finally, I will uh, present some limitations. First of all, uh, Petra has mined uh, citations from only 10% of the documents registered there. So there could be a, a possibly high error margin in our calculations. So uh, data related to impact in our study should be taken with uh, caution. Uh, all bibliographic databases are biased for languages and for countries that are being represented, uh, mainly because of accessibility issues. So uh, this happens also in Vitra, uh, because we cannot report everything that has been published in all languages in all countries. So there's some kind of selection of what is being indexed there. Uh, there are also some differences between translation and testing, although we have considered here everything as, a, as, a, as one. Uh, we could see the term interpreting, uh, we could see many other differences. And finally, uh, if we uh, include bibliometrics and historiography, uh, we could have a more um, complete picture of what has been done in cognitive transition interpreting studies. So we could com uh, include a more qualitative uh, strand of data to the quantitative. So that's, uh, uh, this was everything I wanted to, to talk about today. Thank you very much for your attention. And now uh, I think we're going to move on to the questions and comments. So you're very welcome to, to post them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this fascinating uh, presentation. So as uh, Christian said, um, the floor is open to questions. Please type your questions on the chat. Um, and maybe uh, while we wait for, for questions to pop up on the chat, I can break the ice with the first question. Um, and I'd like to ask you what uh, future steps do you see in your research and in bibliometric research in cognitive transition and interpretive studies? Well, one of my obsessions is to create a map of cognitive transition interpreting studies. Uh, and I'm, I, this is what I'm working on right now. Uh, I'm trying to uh, get all the abstracts of these publications that I mentioned, and I'm trying to analyze them, uh, extracting keywords from, from them in order to uh, know exactly what has been done uh, and how the topics, for example, have evolved in time, or how the methodologies have evolved in time, and um, this could also help us to uh, predict or to anticipate what will the, the, the hot points in, in, in our research be in the, in the near future. Uh, regarding the future of cognitive transition testing studies, uh, we think that it's gaining momentum. I think that it's gaining a lot of attention and will still be gaining attention in the near future. I expect uh, many more authors to come, uh, many new topics to be investigated, uh, many new professional fields that are being developed right now. Uh, of course, the impact of new technologies are going to, to have uh, a great a big role in, in, in preparing new research, in developing new research. So uh, all this will have an impact in the way and the topics uh, on the, the number of authors that are uh, even involved in, in cognitive transition testing research. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christian, and thank you very much to the audience for listening. Um, uh, if there are no more questions for the, from the audience, I think we can um, put an end to this event a few of us have to go back to class, I suppose. Uh, so thank you very much again, Christian, for your lecture.
uh, and to the audience, uh, just a very quick reminder uh, on our next lecture of the series, which will be on November the 12th, where um, NC2 Lab Associate Professor Bukuzwa Wyatt will talk about directionality and transition. So thank you very much, save the date, and uh, have a nice afternoon.